said hello. Cool. Um, so this is the uh, final exciting session of what I hope has been a uh, wonderful first day of the conference. And this is exciting lightning talks for which I will hand over to our delightful MC, Ben. Well, thank you. All right. So, oh, well, thank you again. So before we get started with the lightning talks, there's a board outside also for boffs, bird, bird, birds of a feather sessions. Basically, the idea is the, at the end of tomorrow, um, get into groups of people who have similar passions. So there's one talk up there for um, uh, blue hackers. Thank you, my brain. And the other one was a security slash crypto. So I'll get those two um, boff organizers to come up and just give you a quick intro on what they're about so you know what you're getting yourself in for. If there's anybody else here who has any um, things they want to talk about to, to find a group of people who have shared ideologies, passions, whatever, um, come up and just do a talk now and say, look, I'm interested in X, Y, Z. If anybody wants to talk more about it, let's do a boff. So if anybody wants to, um, I'll pass over to Ian first, and then um, Fraser is right there. And then um, just stick your hand up. Shall sure. I have a passion for depression and anxiety and stress. No. But I do have a passion for, you know, getting the word out there that it's actually really kind of normal thing. Many of us deal with it. Um, so many years ago now, I think it was 2008 in Sydney, I stood up on a podium and, and did a short talk on that. And um, since then, Blue Hackers has existed. And sometimes people ask, what does it do? And the answer is not much. Um, you will all have seen those little stickers. Who hasn't seen those little stickers? Ah, see, we're getting somewhere. Um, so those little stickers belong on your on your laptop, and you can give them to a friend and so on. It's just a little sign, you know, that you're aware of things going on, and you know whether you're dealing with that kind of stuff yourself or not. It's a kind of a nice, quiet, friendly gesture, without being in front in someone's face that there's uh, that there's a bit of understanding. Um, so that's the main thing that is done now at some of the conferences. Um, recent LCAs, uh, Linux Confs, and OSTCs, we've also um, been able to sponsor um, having counselors and psychologists present um, to essentially provide free sessions for those who are you know, pondering, should I need some professional help or maybe not, and just maybe have a chat with someone. That's, that's actually worked out rather well. Now, we've not been able to do that for this conference, but what we will have is a both. Um, and the BOF is not a giant wind fest where we all discuss our problems. That's not what it's about. But, you know, maybe you have some questions on, on little, little life hack tick, tricks and that kind of stuff. Um, such a, it's a nice friendly session and we're not going to do any therapy. We don't do that. Because I'm not an expert and no one else here is either. We just know a little bit about ourselves and we can share some ideas and, and that's about it. So that's what that BOF is about. It generally doesn't need that much time, like half an hour or some, something. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, hello. Um, does anybody among us uh, care about privacy? Yeah. Any, anyone not care? Um, Why are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> does, uh, is anyone in the room concerned about the uh, mass surveillance regime that is being implemented in this country? Nah. nah, it's no big deal. That'll never get misused. Um, okay, so we're going to have a sort of a GPG key signing slash crypto party boff tomorrow. Um, if you don't know what um, GPG or OpenPGP is, that's fine. Uh, we can teach you. So it's uh, for end-to-end -end, uh, email privacy and uh, encryption and uh, signing as well. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in learning how to use Tor or VPNs or all of these other good crypto things uh, come along and there'll be people there who know about them and can help you get started. Uh, any questions? No? Cool. All right. See you all there then. So before I get started with the lightning talks, does anybody else want to propose a boff? Nope. Cool. Um, in which case, uh, Blair, if you'd like to make your way to the front. Ah. 
please use your laptop. Um, so every presenter will have five minutes, um, which will take us about 45 minutes to get through nine of us. Uh, some people will take less, which is good. Some people will take more, in which case I yank them off with an imaginary stick. Uh, there's a timer up here, which will start counting down soon. I'll just give the first presenter a slight, a slight head start in terms of setting up their equipment, um, which is uh, locked. Excellent. That's going to be a really good start. Oh, no, it didn't block. Wicked. Um, so there'll be a countdown. When it gets to 15 seconds, the background will turn slightly red because it's a bit of a warning sign. And at that point, the audience are allowed to start going, ooh, and maybe do a little bit of a drum roll and just really make the person who's up on the front feel really pressured to finish as quickly as possible so that we can all get out of here and, and uh, make our way towards dinner. Is dinner happening straight afterwards, or is there a bit of a break in between? Okay, so we'll have half an hour to make our way to the buses. Excellent. Excellent. So I'll, uh, Tim apparently is going to carry us all to the conference venue, but I'll tell him. I'll let him talk, talk to you more about that afterwards. <laughs> all right. So uh, without any further ado, I'll pass over. Five minutes. It is long. So, uh, Blair, your five minutes start now. Alrighty. Um, for those who came to the talk earlier on, I said you could actually implement subpos uh, on an ESP8266 module. Um, I didn't kind of go into the detail about that, but um, I just figured might as, well, might as well fit into five minutes right here. Um, I've just got a little ESP8266 module here on just power supply and a USB to UART converter. Um, and I'll hopefully make this all work uh, with the demo gods' very generous um, thing. All right, cool. Um, so I've just got one of these points here. Um, I'm just going to load this in onto the module. Um, this is rest point. Um, I've just got uh, some positions here. Um, oh, you can't see that. There we go. Just got some positions here. Um, I've just copied and pasted the bottom one there, I think it was. Um, on the Subpods website, there's actually an, a JavaScript SSID coder, which you can actually use to encode your position information into the SSID. Uh, I've pre-filled all that information there, but um, you just type it in and, and it does its thing. Um, hit encode. It'll spit out a whole bunch of gibberish. Um, you can then copy and paste that uh, into your favorite editor of choice. I'm a Microsoft fan, not really, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Then once you've done that, you can use uh, probably Minicom or whatever um, to, to, to put that onto the ESP8266 module. Uh, this has just got the standard AT firmware, which allows you to just kind of set an SSID, do basic stuff. Um, so that's what I'm using at the moment. Uh, if you just, for example, can you see that? Yep, uh, Sandusky, it's just the standard AT firmware on there. Um, I'll just copy that string in there, which I've also combined with just the set, um, set access point command here. Just entered that into here, and I'll set SSID, set OK. Um, I'll just see if I find my phone, there it is. Uh, so that should be working now. If you installed the app before, you should actually see that, hopefully on your, your, your phone, but I'll just demo it here if it's going to work. Let's see. Oh, no. Nope. And let's try that one more time. Mirroring is started. Ah, the demo gods are angry. That's okay. Um, hopefully, you might might be able to see that, but. I'll just show you on my phone if it loads up. So as you can see, uh, it's just picked up that one there. I've removed the ones from the room that were here previously, but um, it's it's now there on the device. It, it's that easy to actually to put this onto an ESP8266 module and give your position, essentially. Um, obviously, there's more information on the website. If you missed the talk earlier, I don't know if it's being recorded, but you should be able to see that on that as well. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd show you how quick and easy it is to, to set it up on Something as simple as that that costs about three bucks on eBay. So you can then stick them around your room, get positioning, and have fun. Too easy. One minute thirty.
Oh wait, that's what we left. Cool. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. Um, the whole the whole purpose of this is actually to uh, be extensible. So you can you can eventually, when I implement time of flight into the the system, um, get sort of centimeter accuracy. Um, it will eventually compete with other products on the market, a la Decker Wave and a few of the other uh, positioning modules. Um, it's just sort of a, a worst case scenario, or best case scenario, to be able to enable any sort of functionality. So it's it's sort of future proof in a sense. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> um, you could probably get a laser or something or other to do that, I suppose. Yeah. Any other questions? Was that clear? Hopefully not. Maybe. Cool. And my PC's crashed, so great. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you, Blair. Thank you. Next up, we have Fraser, who's going to be harping on about functional programming. This is the OSDC 2015 edition. Apparently it's happened before and he's still alive, so it can't be the, such a bad thing. Your time starts now. Okay, this thing is on. I am big and there we go. Okay, yeah, um, 2015 edition. So, um, what is functional programming? Functional programming is a programming paradigm that treats the execution of a program as the evaluation of functions. Oh, my programming language has functions. Well, no, we're talking about real functions. Functions in the mathematical sense. Um, so, they have to be pure. Um, they, can only depend on their inputs. What does that give you? Well, it gives you all of the tools of mathematics in constructing, composing, and reasoning about software, which is actually pretty important. Um, so we can compare functional programming to a imperative and object-oriented programming, or collectively, non-functional. Um, applications of functional programming, there are none. It's 100% academic. Um, there are no real-world applications of functional programming. After all, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if a uh, function is pure, well, it can't do I.O. What use is a program that can't do I.O.? Um, case closed, functional programming, totally useless. Um, actually, that's not quite true. There is one important uh, use of functional <laughs> programming. It helps you feel superior, and I'll uh, have an example uh, on the next slide. Um, see if you can work out which one is there. Oh, by the way, uh, functional programmers sometimes talk about optics and lenses. Uh, op opti optics and lenses, yes. So we have the monocle. Um, there's actually a library called Monocle for Scala. Um, okay. So uh, despite the complete lack of real-world applications for FP, um, the Linux Conf AU 2016 uh, committee have accepted a functional programming mini-conf. <laughs> um, so that's on the 2nd of February, uh, which is the Tuesday of LCA next year. And uh, if you want to come to that, well, you should come to Linux Conf AU anyway, because it's an awesome conference. But if for some reason you want to come just for the one day, you can for only $90. The call for papers is currently open. And uh, we're looking for people who have interesting things to say or share about functional programming, um, languages, libraries, tools, uh, experiences, learning or teaching FP, anything along those lines is in scope. And uh, if you have something along those lines to share, please uh, submit a proposal. Uh, we already have a couple of awesome speakers lined up. Um, we have Katie Miller. Um, some of you will prob no doubt know her. Um, she's now uh, over in London working at Facebook, but they're kindly lending her to us in uh, February. Um, so she's going to be coming and talking about what uh, she's doing at Facebook and how they're using Haskell. And uh, Tony Morris, who's a well-known functional programming educator and uh, programmer at Data61, formerly known as NICTA, a research organisation in Australia, um, he'll be coming to talk about um, principles of abstractions, uh, how abstractions arise 
and how they can be applied. So um, apart from that, we've got the call for papers open, the submissions are rolling in, so we hope to put together a very compelling program. And uh, are there any questions? If not, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fraser. Next up, we have uh, Jack Skinner. And he's going to be talking about emotive coding in PHP. Your time starts. Testing. Oh, good. Okay. Fingers crossed. As soon as this reloads. I probably have something embarrassing on terminal. Is that is that right? I wasn't looking. Good. Probably passwords or something. Nothing important, right? Yeah, let's do. Can we see that? Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk about emotive now. coding in. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Head start. I'm going to talk about emotive coding in PHP. Uh, I'm told it's trendy to put your Twitter handle on your slides. That's it. Heckles. Um, Hopefully no compliments, um, insults, all, all, all welcome after conference. I know we have a code of conduct. Um, but please, tweet me. Um, so PHP, I, I love coding with APIs. And at the moment, we have to uh, get a whole JSON document and sort it through a different field. And you've got this horrible use sort function. Now, one of the things I love about the new versions of PHP is we get uh, a new operator, the spaceship operator. So much more accurate than what we want to do in so few lines of code. Um, and it, it gets me thinking about how we express ourselves as programmers and what we're trying to achieve in logic. Um, in this particular example, um, we've got the, the new uh, null coalesce operator for nulls and throwing out other values. So we're reducing lots of if statements into uh, one-liners, which most of our code style manager peoples are going to not like. So has anyone written a comment like this in some code? Maybe they've gone back to code and they've gone, oh, I should probably warn future self about that. Um, this is a well and good. This is better. Um, this is from Laravel framework in the early days. Um, and until such time, it was decided that we needed to think more about the children, and it got removed, which was particularly sad. Now, going beyond this, I, we, we don't just put this in our comments. Uh, boil it down. What's this? Does anyone know what this is? Ah, it's more than numbers. It's an A, thank you very much. Uh, we're expressing ourselves in ones and zeros all the time, when you think about it. Um, can anyone tell me how to represent a Japanese A, though? Ah. Unicode. Um, it looks a little bit like this. Can anyone memorize that? Perhaps not. Very good question. That's how we represent it in code. We can't just print it out. We have to kind of know the bits and the bytes behind it. Um, does anyone know this one, for example? I know Katie does. She's heard this talk before. Um, it happens to be the dragon from earlier. And, and it got me thinking, uh, for a bit of fun, does anyone know this one? This one is a bit of fun, Katie, hands down. Um, poop. Uh, at, at one point, I believe it was one of the most popular used emoji on Twitter. Bit disturbing. Um, so if, has anyone gone to the documentation for their own language to, to go and refer to any kind of information? I have. Has anyone found it accurate? I have. Has anyone found it inaccurate? I have. So here in the PHP documentation, it says uh, a variable has to be within the valid uh, ASCII character set, or it's not a variable. <sighs> Wrong. Flight number's a valid variable. <laughs> uh, has anyone written a horrible hack? M maybe precursed by Hebe Dragons. Would that not be better as poop? So, so maybe a, a better use case. Has anyone ever wanted to swear at a user? Uh, damn users. Or better still, please put keyboard back in box, send back to store, you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, would that not be better described as flip table? <laughs> All valid PHP, I, I might remind you. 
So I want to encourage you to think more about the code you're writing, write more emotively, more descriptively about how you're feeling. Put it in your variables. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. This has been my lightning talk. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Damn. Thank you, Jack. Next up, we have Casey West, who's going to be talking about Enterprise Pearl 6 TM. Your time starts now. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, Pearl 6. We've all been anticipating it uh, to be released by Christmas for 15 years. Uh, turns out that's this Christmas. Um, so, if you want to get it uh, running in development, you should use Rakuto Brew. Uh, it's like Homebrew on your Mac or uh, Pearl Brew, but it's Rakuto Brew. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, if you want to write uh, enterprise applications, obviously you're going to be writing microservices, which are APIs. And so we can use a Perl 6 uh, web application framework called Belliador, uh, which is a dancer variant uh, written for Perl 6, uh, to write some microservices. You need to deploy it to a platform. So we have an open source platform as a service called Cloud Foundry. It's something that I like a whole lot. And if you want to talk more about that, we should do it uh, at dinner. Uh, but this is a full platform as a service. And uh, in order to deploy to it, uh, we need to build a container using its system of build packs, which basically puts all the middleware that your application needs into a container and then your app so that it can be uh, deployed and scaled out and all that crazy enterprise stuff. Um, so we do have an app. It's called CF for Cloud Foundry, ENV Perl 6. Uh, let's take a look at that. Um, this is obviously some basic Perl 6 here. Um, you just use Validor. We'll be uh, writing out JSON. We'll get our port that we should run on from the environment. Um, I mentioned that JSON earlier. Uh, our JSON is going to print out the instance number, the instance ID for which Cloud Foundry instance we're currently running, uh, and then it'll run. I've deployed this version already to Cloud Foundry, so you can see the output from what, uh, what we run, which is CF push here. Um, and it has a, uh, a URL, thanks to the dynamic router, so uh, live demos being what they are, and internet access to America being what it is. There we go. So we have an instance, instance zero, but this isn't very enterprisey, so let's add an enterprise feature. There we go. And we'll go ahead and push this out. So uh, let's see. Two minutes. Yeah, we might be able to do this. So while this is deploying, uh, let me just say a few things. Containers, Docker, uh, return on investment, um, uh, continuous delivery, uh, enterprise, in the cloud, thank you, a cloud native. That's a good one. What's that? As a service, yes, uh, obviously, uh, software, uh, infrastructure, uh, platforms. Um, all of these are things that you would say in order to try to sound credible in an enterprise setting. So this is, this is nearly done here. Um, we are just uploading a droplet, uh, which is building this, uh, this container. Um, so incidentally, uh, this is actually very much uh, Perl 6 running. Uh, it, the last version that we have here is from uh, September that we built. It's fetching our app, getting this container going, and we'll see how it, how it plays out here. Do, do, do. Obviously, part of being enterprise is wasting a lot of time. Yeah, excellent. Uh, if you want to tweet about this ridiculousness. OK, here we go. Um, so it looks like our app has started. Uh, we have one instance running. And uh, we are getting so close. So let's reload this and see what we got. Aha, enterprise grade Perl 6. But what is enterprise grade without web scale? Let's scale this application up. We'll get uh, three instances running, let's say. Yes, and 
Let's just take a look at that. And while we're doing that, we'll also see about getting it running here. So another important thing to know about Perl 6 is that it is about uh, 10 times what Perl 5 ever was, if you count memory management. And let's see. We have instance 1. We have instance 0. So we have horizontally scaling uh, enterprise grade Perl 6. So in five minutes. There you go. Thank you. Next up, we have, um, I was given this post-it note. So I, I believe that it's so futuristic, even Paul didn't know what the talk title was going to be. I'm just going to hand over to Paul. Your time has already started. Yes? Yes! Excellent. Hi, everyone. My name's Paul. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the moon. And I want that on my side here. So, we already have one person in the audience who plays Kerbal Space Program. Um, and that's great, because this here is really an excuse for me to show you pictures of Kerbal Space Program. Um, so, all the screenshots here are from my game. So, as some of you might know, um, the moon is far away. Um, it's around about 384 megameters, and um, if any of you have looked at the moon, which hopefully some of you have, the same side always faces the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you get something which sort of looks like that. Um, you don't often see the other side, but if you play Kerbal Space Program uh, with enough mods installed, you can see the other side. So one thing that my mother used to tell me when I was growing up uh, is that the moon used to be closer. And I thought she was just making this up, along with, like, there were dinosaurs walking across the Westgate Bridge if I didn't brush my teeth on time. Um, but no, it actually ends up that it's true, that the moon used to be closer. And these two things are related. So why are they related? Well, the reason is because, as I've discovered, space is really cool. And I'm going to give you some names of things. Um, first of all, low Earth orbit. You've probably heard this. What low Earth orbit means is you've got something in orbit around the Earth, and it's going faster than the rotation of the Earth. So it takes less than a day for it to spin around. High Earth orbit means it takes longer than a day to spin around. And geosynchronous means it takes exactly a day. So you now have these terms. The moon is in high Earth orbit. It takes an entire month, or almost an entire month, to get around the Earth. And um, you might also know, if you've ever sort of gone to the seaside, that the moon causes tides. So at this point, I leave my beautiful KSP screenshots, and uh, I go to my own artistic work, which I have here. Um, so we can see the moon in the, uh, the corner there. We can see the Earth in the middle rotating. And you can see there's a tidal bulge. Now, what's happening is the Earth is rotating, but that tidal bulge tries to remain aligned to the moon, and you generate a torque. It resists against the rotation of the Earth. It slows down the rotation of the Earth. That absolutely terrified me when I learned that was happening, until I realized that this was the reason for leap seconds. And I now could show off to all of my friends what leap seconds were, because until then, I didn't understand. Now, it also happens that if you go back about 620 million years ago, um, we had 21-hour days. The Earth was rotating faster, 21 hours in a day. If you go back to when we had dinosaurs, of which this is not a dinosaur, this is a dimetrodon, which existed before dinosaurs, but back at the time of dinosaurs, it was about a 23-hour day. Now, if I've got time, which I do, there is some more information. Um, so if you think about what's going on with my diagram, but you find a better version of that from Reddit, um, you end up with this. And when the Earth is rotating, you can see that it's actually moving that bulge around. The bulge is trying to get back towards the moon. What this means is it actually makes the moon go 
faster. And by faster, I mean it gains orbital, moment, uh, orbital energy. So the Earth's angular momentum, which is turning around and pushing that bulge, is being converted into the Moon's orbital energy. Now what that does is it boosts the Moon in its orbit, it gets further away, but by being further away it also has a longer orbital period, because space is weird. The flip side of all of this is if you have something in low Earth orbit, that is it's moving around the Earth and it takes less than a day each time, such as this little capsule which you can almost see there in this screenshot, um, it will eventually deorbit itself. It will be spinning up the Earth and it will be moving closer and closer and eventually it will sort of get caught by the atmosphere and come in. So the other question is, why is it always, oh, I've got 20 seconds left, why is it always the same side of the moon which is facing the Earth? Well, it has tidal bulges of its own, except that you don't really notice them because they're made of moon rock and everything, and they try really hard to stay aligned with the Earth, and we say that it's tide-locked. And this is super common for moons, which gives me an excuse to show you a picture of Europa, which I took, and eventually the Earth will spin down, we'll have like a thousand hour days, and the sun will explode. Impress your friends, may you go to space today. Thank you very much. Talk this talk, it's on GitHub. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Next up, we have Aya, who's going to be talking to us about Ubuntu phone. Your time starts now. May I be your mic stand today, sir? Thank you. Restarted. No, I want that. That's okay. Hello. Um, quiz time. Who here has an Android phone? Yes. Yeah. Who here uses an iPhone? Yeah. Okay. Minority. Minority. Learn. Um, okay. Other 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 brands. What have you got? Hmm. Nokia. Oh, old one, new one. My stepdaughter stuck an old flip phone Nokia in the washing machine a couple of months ago. It was still on. It worked afterwards. It still rocks. I don't think we can do that with any of our phones. Don't try this, but it, they were quality, weren't they? Okay, any others? Any others? No Windows stuff around? Excellent. Okay, I have an Ubuntu phone. Yeah, okay. Um, now why? Because it exists, that's a good, good reason, okay, for you know, for us. Um, but another main reason is I really get the EBs with with Android. You know, anytime an app an app updates, it wants some more um, privileges on the phone. And yes, with the new, what is it, Android five, you can now control that better. But in the end, things start to not work. And if you don't upgrade, then other things start to not work. You get the idea. And you have a slightly older phone. And then the newer version of the app refuses to work, and it really annoys me. So I thought, I'll, I'll play with this. You know, early days, early platform, but at least I know kind of how it works, because I run Ubuntu on my laptop, you know, it, and, and in, if in, even if you don't run Ubuntu, it kind of looks like Linux. Um, so I've got a root shell in here, because no one has bothered to actually lock it down. I just type my password, which I know anyway, and, you know, I can, I can get to it and things kind of just work. Um, if you're, who is familiar here with the Unity desktop? Yeah, you'll find this looking familiar. Now, I tried to make my emulator work on my laptop and it blew up in my face, but maybe you can have, yeah, you get the idea? It's there. Um, and I'm quite happy to hand over my phone. You can play with it a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, I tried this on my laptop, it blew up. It, it should have an emulator that you can actually build build apps with, and it, it does work, but sometimes I destroy things on my laptop, so that's, that's how that works. Um, anyway, what I'd like to do here is encourage lots of you hackers here, a bit like me, um, you know, to build stuff for this phone and buy a phone like this. They're not terribly expensive at all. This one is a Spanish 
piece of work. Um, and it's actually, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. The battery life, the audio quality, it's all pretty darn good. Um, it's called the BQ, and this is a BQ Aquarius 4.5. HD, which means it has a slightly bigger screen. There's also slightly smaller ones. Um, there's a Chinese phone now that does it. Some of your existing phones may also be able to run Ubuntu because there's other builds for those. Um, so there's quite a lot of possibilities. So what I like about this platform is that it's actually more open to mucking around with and just actually understanding what's going on as well as not getting crap onto it um, than some of the other platforms that many of us use now and I think that's a quite a good advantage and look it's probably not perfect that's great then there's a bit of stuff for us to do um, and the good thing is not all of the stuff is finished yet which means we can influence the development more so I think that's a that's actually a rather good idea um, so I just like to draw your attention to that and well please talk to me and and, and see how to actually build stuff um, finally many things on this phone work in um, as a web app. Um, I actually find that that actually works quite well. So my Facebook, rather than being an app that I have to get from Facebook with all those nasty privileges, actually is like a little web container um, which has its own cookies and its own other stuff. It can't bleed and leak and whatever it is contained, which I think is actually quite a slick idea. So first of all, I don't have to install someone else's app that I get the EBS with. And secondly, it's not in my web browser. Well, it is, but it's kind of in its own little sandbox. Um, many apps like that um, are around, but there are also other, other languages you can write your, your code in. It's, uh, it's fairly convenient. It uses a, well, as one option, a variety of Qt um, with this, the, the mere um, window manager that it uses. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. Talk to me if you're, more, if you're interested in hearing more about it. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Next up, we have uh, Katie McLaughlin, who's going to be talking about Hatrack. Is that totally working? Oh my gosh, it's actually working. This is great. Oh, okay. okay, this Your is time. going to work. Start. Oh, now? Yes, okay, this is good. I have a thing working and my clicker is working. Excellent, okay, I'm going to be talking about hats. There will be some audience participation, so please load up Twitter on your phones. I'm going to be running through this as sort of an IKEA style man manual, hence the uh, wonderful uh, mock Swedish name that it's just a bad pun. No, it's actually a bad pun in Swedish, never mind. Um, so, we do a lot of code stuff, yeah? We do open source, it happens to be code. So there's some really, really nice mechanisms to be able to work out how much we actually do in code. We have things like GitHub, which have wonderful charts and graphs and all the data, and we can accumulate all this, and we can see all the code that we're doing. But what about everything else that we're doing in open source that isn't code? What mechanisms do we have in place to actually be able to quantify and acknowledge all the work that we do outside of actual code? It's, it's just like, what, what do I do? I don't know. So let me tell you about Leslie. Leslie is absolutely amazing. Leslie Hawthorne has been enabling uh, open source communities for a number of years now. And she had this wonderful conversation with a lovely lady called Deb Nicholson at LCA a couple of months ago now, where they decided to start this thing called Let's All Build Hat Racks, L-A-B-H-R. This is where the audience participation comes in, because I need you to pre-type this hashtag out and think about something nice to do with it on Twitter. So, story goes that they were discussing about how they're both now involved in a um, software, uh, helping third world countries in a software found foundation and Deb was really excited to be involved in this because she said that this is great, it's something that I can put on LinkedIn and put it on my hat rack so people can know what I'm doing. She doesn't do any code, but this is something that she can actually share. So Leslie decided to make a five-point plan as to how you can help acknowledge and attribute all this other work that people are doing. So five steps. Step one, write a list. Step two, send the list. That's pretty easy. Why don't you do that now on Twitter using that hashtag that happens to be at the bottom of the screen? Think of something nice to say about someone and tweet it. Do it now. Um, also, what you could do is, say, put a recommendation on LinkedIn. 
because these things are really, really super cool when you go through and see that someone has actually, oh, someone else is recommending someone else. They hold us so much value that they're really cool to get and really cool to give because presents. And a really, really good thing to do with this is to do it to someone that's not like you. So if you're a manager, do it for one of your programmers. If you do design, do it for one of your developers. If your developers do it for, say, your marketing person. And we can share the love and everyone can be happy and it's great. And if you're not sure who to thank, you can always check what people have been doing on GitHub because I've made an app that shows not just not the code contributions but everything else in GitHub. And that's called Octohat. So, oh, I got a clap, yay. Um, so what it'll do is it'll show all the comments, all the code reviews, all the other fun stuff that isn't actually a commit to master, which GitHub doesn't currently show. So that's cool. You can use this app. How long do I have? I have a little bit over a minute. So this is the time where I normally um, embarrass Chris or Paul or Jack, wherever he is. But today, I'm going to show you how to be nice to someone. Hello, Ben. I met Ben in a pub two years ago at OSDC 2013, and I pretty much said, hmm, this is a nice conference. I reckon I could do a talk at it next year. I'm now the treasurer of the committee that used to run this thing. So he's a little bit of an enabler, and he's a very nice person and a great friend and a good mentor and stuff. And if you haven't met him, you should ask him about BuzzConf. And he's, he's an overall really nice person. And I wanted to thank you in front of an audience with a recording and a microphone and stuff because you can't heckle back. So thank you. <laughs> so yes, you too can make someone very embarrassed and very red for um, being nice to them. So use the hashtag. That, that, that link there is the original blog that started this whole thing by Leslie, and there's my app about all the things. And I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Next up, we have Donna, who's going to be talking to us about the Open Invention Network. Now, <laughs> hello everybody, I am, hello. Hi, hello. hello, hello, in case you don't know, I'm Donna Benjamin and I have five jobs, one for each day of the working week. I have a few others for those other days but I don't talk about them in public. Um, one of the ones, I think this is a Monday job, is I work with the Open Invention Network. Hands up if you've heard of the Open Invention Network. Okay, hands up if your organisation is a member. All of you others, I would like to talk to you about becoming a member of the Open Invention Network. Who are we and what do we do? We basically work to protect Linux against patent trolls. Um, who has heard the term patent troll before? Very good. Who thinks that patent trolls are a bit of a problem? Not as many of you. Who of you think patent trolls are awesome? Okay, so the Open Invention Network was formed 10 years ago. We recently celebrated 10 years, which is kind of awesome. I've only been there for a few months, so I can't take any credit whatsoever. Uh, well, let me think about that. No, no, I can't. Um, so uh, we were founded by organisations like um, Sony and IBM and Red Hat and a couple of others. And uh, later on, Google joined. And basically, they put a whole bunch of money in a big pot to say, this patent troll thing is a problem. Think back about 10 years ago, and you might remember TomTom Tom was using Linux very famously and also very famously got attacked. And I think that was one of the catalysts that formed OIN. So basically, now OIN has a huge pool of patents they actually have a defensive pool of patents to protect Linux. So if people go after um, people in the Linux system, then um, OIN uh, has this pool that you can you know, cross license and say, hey, you know, it's that 
like nuclear war, really, um, you know, mutually assured destruction kind of thing is the size of the patent pool, so don't do it. So basically what we want is everyone who is open source friendly, free software friendly, using open source or builds their business on Linux um, or open source software in general, then join us. There is absolutely no cost. It's totally free to join. All we ask is that you pledge not to use your patents against Linux. If you don't have any patents, that's a very easy pledge to make. Also, if you use Linux, you're probably not going to want to attack it. So in this context, yes, hello. So if I don't have any patents, what's the value to you enjoying? Very good question, Ben. I'm so glad you asked. If you have no patents, the value to you in joining is that you can still be, the patent trolls can still come after you for infringing their patents. Now, all of us potentially infringe someone's patents because there are some really stupid ones out there. And patent trolls make their money on this. They actually send letters to companies saying, you're infringing my patents, I'm going to sue you. Or you could just pay me like $1,000 and I'll go away. And a lot of small businesses will go, think it's easier to pay the $1,000 than go through a patent lawsuit. So they've got a very lucrative, very lucrative business model. But OIN is there to stop all that. We're cheery people. So basically we just ask that people in our ecosystem join OIN and help stand with us. So the benefit to you is being part of the, the community. There's no cost to you. The benefit is mostly feel good. So that's OIN. So now those of you who are not members, will you put up your hand if you will now think about becoming a member? Those hands aren't up very high. Um, all I'm asking you is to think about it. Okay? Okay, if you've promised to think about it, that's awesome. Come and see me, and I'll be a little bit more useful about it than I've been in this short lightning talk. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Donna. Next up, we have somebody called Ben Deckroy, um, who's going to be talking to you about BuzzConf. No, I'll, I'll pass it over as soon as I give myself the countdown timer start. So, so um, it's already started. and again, it's failing. So um, I'm just going to talk about BuzzConf because it's really not going to take me five minutes. So um, hands up if you've not heard of BuzzConf. Okay, so I'm talking to you. Um, and, and in fact, if you have heard of BuzzConf, you're not coming, I'm also talking to you. So BuzzConf is essentially, it, it came from um, Barcamp. I ran the first Barcamp in 2007 in Australia, and it's taken off really well in certain cities, and it's kind of diminished quite a bit in Melbourne over the past few years. I think that's probably because of the meetup space. There's a lot of things going on. You can go out every evening of a weekday and get free pizza, beer, and learn something. So um, I was talking to the, the, Buzzcon, uh, the Barcamp community. It's really confusing because they have the same initialism. Um, and we, we try to work out what can grow from this. So BuzzConf is essentially, it, it, again, it's a weekend event, much like a, an unconference or a bar camp. Uh, the morning is traditional conference, much like this. The afternoon is unconference and workshops. And then we've also got a hackathon that runs overnight. So we started putting together a call for proposals, and we've got a whole load of awesome speakers coming along. Um, it's only in two and a half weeks, so if you want to register, make sure you do that soon. And there is a, a discount code that you can't read there. Um, conveniently, it's OSDC. So uh, if you remember OSDC, Jack's pointing at me. Or, or Jack's Twitter handle, developer Jack, will also get you a 10% discount. Um, so please use that and register. Um, but one of the things we were thinking is there's so many events like this where the, uh, the, the technical partner will turn to the non-technical partner and say, hey, there's this really awesome thing I want to go to. And they're like, oh, another weekend by myself? Or I'm going to have to look after the kids by myself again? Well, it's camping. So bring the whole family along. We've got a kids' track. There's music on the Friday and Saturday night. Um, it's, it's going to be more like a festival than a conference, we think. So we're calling it a technology festival. Um, I'd really love to tell you more about it if you're interested. Come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, but oh, uh, buzzconf.io is the domain. OSDC is your discount code. And I'll see you in two and a half weeks. Thanks. So with my lightning talk hat on again, um, would you please thank all the lightning talk speakers tonight for awesome talks. Um, thank you for your attention. Hope you had fun. And I'll just pass back to Tim. Thank you, Ben. So uh, that's the end of our exciting fun here in this 
part of Tasmania today, this specific local part. We're going to go to another part that's slightly further away that requires buses. Um, between, how are we doing for time? We've got heaps of time. Um, the buses will be leaving at 6 p.m., so that's 40 minutes from now. Um, so if you could, if you are coming to dinner, which I'm pretty sure um, most of everybody is, um, if you could make your way down there for then, that would be excellent. Where <laughs> there? Um, out the front of the um, front of the main entrance. Main entrance. Main entrance. Yes. Yes. Do I need to mention anything else? <laughs> Bring your monies. Um, um, our wonderful friends at OSIA have um, agreed to put a certain amount of money on the bar. Um, so please thank them very much. Um, do still bring your monies anyway, just in case. See how we go. There is FPOS. There is FPOS. There was FPOS last time I was there. <laughs> There's FPOS. There's ATMs here in the uh, uh, foyer. foyer. Thank you. Uh, downstairs. So if you want to get cash and get that here, there's FPOS facilities at the venue as well. Um, and one more thing. Get lots of cash because at the dinner there will be a big cauldron in which you can put money for the Hobart Refugee Legal Centre who are trying to get a migration officer to help people go through all the mind-numbing paperwork about becoming a refugee in Hobart. So bring lots of cash, all the cash, and put it in the cauldron and we will give it to the people. Um, I'll have the cauldron here tomorrow and Thursday as well with some information about the people, but bring all the cash. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. And with that, um, I need to go and sit down, I think. <laughs> so let's go. Woo!